<laughs> Hello and welcome to the first episode of the Kofi Annan Dialogues Live. Today, Kofi Annan, former Secretary General of the United Nations, is launching a series of online conversations on critical <coughs> global issues with young people around the world. Mr. Anand believes that the views and experiences of the younger generation are widely ignored by decision makers and wants to empower young people and inspire them to lead. And I'm sure Mr. Anand will elaborate more on that point himself. And so the Kofi Annan Foundation, in partnership with the global youth organization One Young World and the International Telecommunication Union, has organized this series of dialogues with young people <coughs> excuse me, on key issues central to their lives. Today's session on the topic of young people and leadership is the first in this series. We are joined today by six impressive young people from different parts of the world who will share their understanding and experiences of leadership and their vision for the role of young people within decision making. Together with Mr. Anand, they will explore three specific sub-themes. First, what does it take to be a leader? Next, young people and politics. And third, what are the strategies and uh, tools to empower young people. Towards the end of the session, I will invite participants to briefly summarize their takeaways and to indicate any collaborative actions they intend to continue with or initiate as a result of the hangout with Mr. Anand. These were reported at the One Young World Summit 2013 in Johannesburg, South Africa. In this Google Hangout, we are also joined by an online audience. <coughs> you can log into the Dialogues website with a Google Plus profile or a Facebook profile and join in. <coughs> we encourage you to post questions and comments, and we can incorporate them into the discussion. You can also join in on Twitter by using the general hashtag Kofi and Anne Live or the issue specific hashtag Kofi on Leadership. One final thing, I am nearly finished. I also invite you to participate in our online poll, which will accompany the series to capture and promote your opinions and ideas on specific issues. The results of these polls will also be shared at the One Young World Summit in Johannesburg in October. Now, let me ask each of our participants to briefly introduce themselves. Uh, and we'll go first of all to Chris. Thank you, Louise, and thank you, Mr. Anand. I'm very excited to be participating in this. Uh, my name is Christopher Sinesi, and I'm representing the United States. I am a co-founder um, and currently leading an organization that works with homeless and at-risk youth. Um, and through that experience, I work with many young people and youth um, on the topic of leadership. And a lot of times, um, these youth don't understand what leadership is or that they can be a leader and so I'm very excited to participate in this discussion and, um, and learn, learn from you Mr. Anon and the fellow young leaders today. And can we go to Dan now in Australia? Thanks Louise, yes from the, the land down under. My name's Dan Ryan and it's great to be with you all, um, especially Mr. Anon. It's a great privilege. My role is the 2012 United Nations Youth Representative for Australia which gave me the unique privilege of travelling around Australia in a com comprehensive listening tour, um, showcasing young people involved in socially innovative solutions on my website, and then addressing UN General Assembly um, in October of this year. And off the back of that, I've got several exciting projects in a similar space, so really looking forward to contributing. Excellent. Thank you, Dan. And now, Emmanuel. Thank you so much, Mr. Hannan, for this incredible opportunity to speak with you. I'm Emmanuel from France. I have the great honor to be a One Young World Ambassador. And in the normal life, I have two activities. I'm the co-founder and the president of Women Up, an association dealing, dealing with gender diversity in the workplace and targeting its action towards Gen Y people. I'm also an entrepreneur. I have created the Boson Project which is a laboratory to develop human capital. Concretely, we experiment innovative solutions in order to create value and values for firms by betting on people, and more specifically, on young people and their creative power. Thank you, Manuel. And now to Mauritius for Karuna. Thank you, Luis, and thank you, Mr. Anna. It's really exciting to be hanging out with you. So I'm Karuna Rana uh, from the island of Mauritius, and I'm a sustainable development advocate. I'd had the chance to represent young people within the United Nations Environment Program and attend um, negotiations such as COP17 and Rio Plus 20. 
after which I'm now looking into ways of how can we have effective um, youth participation in political decision-making processes related to the, to the environment. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks, Karuna. And we're over to South Africa now to meet Leslie. Thank you very much, Lewis, and thank you very much, Mastanan, for the great opportunity. I'm Leslie Masibi from South Africa, and I've been involved with One Young World for the past two years, and my involvement has been generally around leadership development and to spur young people to act in terms of changing the social, economic, and political sphere in our countries and both worldwide. And I run a foundation, the Leslie Masibi Foundation. I've been working very closely with the National Youth Development Agency with our mandate, which is to empower young people and to, have, to ensure that they are represented across all fields of political and economic representation. Excellent. Thank you, Leslie. And finally, to Sue Helen. In, uh, you're Mexican, are you not? But you're in Singapore. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Mr. Anand. It's a pleasure to be here and with everyone else. Uh, my name is Sue Helen. I'm from Mexico. I'm currently in Singapore. And my involvement has been mostly in indigenous communities, empowering women and young people to conserve the natural resources and to manage uh, the natural resources in a sustainable way. So I'm very excited to discuss all these topics with you guys. Excellent. Thank you, Sue Helen. And um, um, Mr. Anand, I'll now hand over to you so you can share with us your own views on the, the, on the Kofi Annan Dialogues Live and the importance of engaging with young people in decision making. Thank you. Thank you, Louise, for your introduction. Let me begin by welcoming our young participants, my dear friends. I'm joined by six dynamic young leaders who are committed to finding solutions to some of the most enduring challenges we face. I would also like to welcome all of you who are taking part online. Your input is crucial. Please send us your questions and ideas to enrich these discussions today and throughout the dialogue series. Your active participation will help to build a collaborative exchange of ideas between young people around the world. We are launching this series with a dialogue on young people and leadership. Future episodes will feature topics that young people are most concerned with today, employment, education, democracy, the environment, crime, and corruption. This initiative stems from my belief that the energy, ambition, and capability of young people are among society's greatest assets. You have so much to offer, and yet you are often marginalized from the discussions and decisions that affect your lives and will frame your futures. The purpose of these dialogues is to promote a more inclusive dialogue with young people. By amplifying your voices and concerns and by highlighting your projects for transformative change. I hope that these dialogues will encourage other leaders to transfer their knowledge and experience to the younger generation. I also hope to share some of the lessons on leadership from my own experiences and career. I was fortunate to have served as UN Secretary General soon after the Cold War during a period of significant global change. My goal for these discussions is to inspire young people to step forward and take responsibility for the future of their societies and the wider global community. It is an urgent call, for you are inheriting a rapidly changing world with problems of unprecedented scale and complexity. These challenges also affect Today, for example, many young people face serious obstacles to realizing their full potential. Because of poverty, insecurity, 
unemployment, environmental stress, and conflict. However, you are also blessed with unique strengths. Information and communication technologies make you the most aware and interconnected generation. Social media platforms are providing you with opportunities to organize, mobilize, advocate, and create. You have the knowledge and the tools to seize new opportunities and have an impact beyond the borders of your own countries. Mm. Unfortunately, you are inheriting a world from a, a generation of political leaders, my generation, who have largely failed to address the global imbalances and industrial and institutional failures that are the cause of so many of our problems today. But you must never doubt your own capacity to triumph where others have failed. Mm -hmm. You have to work and think about how we can make this world a better place for all. For I have always maintained that you are never too young to lead. Young people must take ownership and leadership of tomorrow. For that to happen, you have to strengthen your capacity and widen your horizons as global citizens. Good global citizenship begins in the community, be it a village or a school, where you can team up with others to resolve problems. But you must also be aware that your activities could have an impact on people thousands of miles away. By acting locally and thinking globally, young people can lead the way towards a fairer, more secure world. I look forward to our discussion today and hearing how each of you will lead and take forward concrete actions to advance change in your communities. I will now ask Chris to start us off with our first question. What does it take to be a leader? Chris, go on, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Anand. Um, so the first topic, as you mentioned, is what does it take to be a leader? And through my experience, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, I've worked with a lot of young people, and a lot of times people say, well, can I really be a leader? Um, is it defined by a certification, a title, education? Um, what, what is it to be a leader? And so with that said, um, what uh, Sue and I, because uh, this was a topic that Sue and I were talking about, um, wanted to really pose that question on what defines the leader. And so specifically to you, Mr. Anand, um, but also to the young leaders who are joining us here on video and those online, is what does it take to become a leader, and then what are the first steps one can take to be a leader? Good question. Sue? Um, yeah, I think that one of the things that we were talking about and that you just mentioned is that it's, uh, it's related to the perception that society or people in general has on uh, what is a leader. So we might think of people that are leaders as, you know, related to age or positions or formal education or something specific, but then there is this whole set of skills that people might already have or that young people have that have obstacles to realizing and to realize that they, they, they can be leaders. So I think that another important issue is how can we empower people who already have this set of skills to, to realize their full potential. We've had two interesting comments. May I hear from some of the others? Because uh, when you talk about who, what is a leader, what it takes to be a leader, uh, we sometimes tend to look at people on the national scene, big yeah. political leaders or mayors in our community, but we require leadership at all levels. 
and one doesn't have to think in terms of taking on the big issues of the world to be a leader. In fact, when I listen to all six of you introduce yourselves, you're all uh, your leaders already. So let's open up the discussion and see where we go from here. Yes, uh, Leslie. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Anana. I think, uh, basing on what you just said, um, for, for us, um, six youth leaders and many other One Young World leaders and leaders out there, I think, you know, we're moving, slowly moving away from the conventional definition of what it means to be a leader because we don't need to be appointed into position, into political parties or structures for us to become leaders but you are seeing more and more young people who are standing up who are becoming voices of change in their communities who are going ahead and doing things respective of whether the government is there respective of whether they are getting support or not and I think that's what kind of leadership that we need more young people taking accountability for their everyday lives being actively involved in shaping and changing their futures without needing an endorsement from government or from larger uh, media or any other societies also. That, that's a very good point, Leslie, that you make. Because a, a leader would normally confront a situation where you feel you need to do something about it. I've seen young leaders decide we're going to help kids who are not in school by giving them lessons over weekends. I have seen people say we need to help our villagers get clean water we don't have it and I'm going to do something about it it is leadership when you are passing by and you see somebody being bullied and you say enough mm -hmm. stop we can't take this anymore you know and, and take on so it takes all, all shapes and this is what is important it doesn't have to be formalized and it begins from within you and in your relationship with others and the problems around you that you want to impact on. Let, let's continue the discussion. Who else wants to come in? I think Dan wanted Young to. Young leaders, speak up, speak up. Sure, sure. Um, hi, Mr. Dan, Dan, you want to come Dan back, here? Yeah, I was actually going to touch on, on one of the points you just mentioned there, and that was in my travels around Australia. I yeah. met a young girl called Michaela who had identified that many students were dropping out of school prior mm -hmm. to going into the next level. Um, with a group of other friends, she set up a mentoring group and just like you mentioned, ran education on mm -hmm. the weekends. Um, I think what was impressive about Michaela's effort was she was overcoming a lot of adversity w with herself, with her, um, the barriers that she faced um, in her personal life. And also she was doing something that was uncharted. She had no examples of people in her mm -hmm. community doing that before. And, and whether it's in a local community or it's right at the top in the United Nations or similar, there's something yeah. to be said for people going into uncharted waters. Excellent. Excellent. I see, Manuel, you were shaking your head. You wanted to come in? Yeah, yeah, of course. I think on this question, the question of role model is absolutely crucial because us young leaders, we really need role model to think it is possible to change the world. For me, it's a key point. Good. I see Chris, you lifted your hand. Yes, um, I was just uh, kind of wanted to add what we were talking about. I think a lot of times, um, I work with a lot of young people and a lot of um, youth who've been through rough backgrounds, um, and a lot of times they just don't think they could make a difference. They think because of the situation I've been in, because of my past and who I've been, I can't be a leader, I can't make a difference in the world. Um, and so I think that's, that is a roadblock for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and, and it just, it's, it's hard to see because a lot of times people, these young people that I'm working with, they, they don't have goals, they don't have ambitions and it's 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 tough that you know how can we get them to see that they can do anything that they can yeah. put, you know follow their passion put their mind into something yeah. and make it happen but chris for example you'll be surprised as you go forward this group of young people who don't seem to have any ambition who do not believe they can lead you will suddenly find one or two who suddenly begin to wake up and begin to lead 
and begin to take initiatives. I mean, I, if I take the six of you, what made you believe that you can do what you're doing? Without that self-confidence and the initial feeling that you can make a difference, that you can dare, you wouldn't be doing what you're doing. And sometimes it takes someone to inspire you or an act, act, action. And there are times when we are surprised ourselves that situations force us to act. And we are often amazed that there are strengths within us that we didn't know that comes forward because of a situation we have faced. Um, and one or two of you may tell me how you got started, how you identify within yourself that you can lead and not this will follow. Why you took on some of the problems you are, uh, you are dealing with. Who wants to comment? Dan and then uh, Leslie. Thanks, Mr. Anand. Um, for me, it was summarised in a, in a speech to the General Assembly um, by Milena, the, the Slovak Youth Delegate, and she called for a change across the world in our expectations of what youth can achieve. And uh, if I reflect personally on, on what prompted me to do the next thing or get involved in the next project, it's when I share with someone what I've done or what I'm involved in mm -hmm. and they expect that I'm capable of it and make the point that it's a stepping stone to the next thing. Yeah. And whilst it's, it's certainly okay to be surprised within yourself about what you can achieve, yeah. um, having somebody that is confident that you're actually going to achieve the next thing um, can just be, have a spiraling effect and, and that's something I try and pass on to other young people is that expectation we actually can mm. achieve and, and we should have that expectation upon us. Yeah, no, that's a very important point because it's a third party validation people reinforcing what you're doing and belief in what you're doing. Let me go to Leslie. Leslie, let me go to Karuna first and then come back to you. Karuna, you, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Anand. Um, for me, I would like to speak about my experience as a leader and it all started um, by having a sense of responsibility towards uh, my country, especially my island. As you know, Mauritius is a small island developing state, very much vulnerable to the effects of climate change. So sustainable development is, is not a choice. It's a matter of our survival. So it started with, with me having this sense of responsibility towards my island. But then it also continued when people uh, started seeing me as a leader and, I, and they trusted me. And, and then I realized that leadership is it's not about power. Leadership is about creating more leaders. That, that's very good, uh, Karuna. Leslie. Yes, sir. Um, I was saying in my in my experience, um, what, what what generally led me to to becoming a leader and starting the foundation that I've started and doing the work that I've done was because I got into a point where I did not agree with the state has caused not happy in the way things are happening and I, because as a young person who stands to inherit the decisions that are made by our leaders I had to do something as a young person but you know I would I would really like you to share with us just a little bit in terms of because as young people who are trying to make a difference we are faced with constant mm. challenges and along the way we often give up because most of our work are not coordinated and when we don't get the necessary support that we what we want or maybe we don't even get it fast enough and you give up along the lines you know how to tackle such issues to ensure that our ideas don't die along the way no I, I think you've made some very important points here but uh, is it there's one thing to begin to lead but you also need to think in terms of organization and structures and those people you work with it is not enough to be there alone to be able to lead, you need to have a group of people who would work with you. You need to know what it is that you want. You need to be very focused as to the vision and the direction and your objective. You have to find like-minded people like you, band together, work together, and decide what would be the most e effective way to achieve your objective. Would it entail right into your uh, parliamentarians? Would it entail sometimes a, a, a mini demonstration going to the office to let them know you have a point? 
with it until getting other young people together and say, let's do something about this and when we act, others will follow or we will uh, wake up. You know, and uh, uh, don't feel that because you are young, people will not listen to you or you cannot lead. As I've said time and time again, you are never too young to lead. If the idea is good and the objective is clear, you will be able to lead and you will get the support uh, ne necessary. But of course, when you say, where do we go for support? You must also know what support you need to be able to articulate it and, and uh, make demands. You'll be surprised. The support does not necessarily have to come from the government. Sometimes people in your own community, some of the companies in your community will be inspired by what you young people are doing and support you through donations, through offering facilities to make your work uh, successful. There will be resistance, there will be others who will be opposed, who will think uh, these young people are being uppity and uh, jumping ahead of themselves. You should be able to take that and continue. Don't let it dissuade you. You can try and explain your position, but you have to carry on. Thank you, sir. Any other comments on, on, on this? I think we are soon coming to the uh, end of this segment of our <clears throat> discussions. Louise, I think I see you want to come in here. I do. Um, we've got um, many comments coming in online um, uh, um, from all around the world. There's um, a couple of questions which um, you've, you've um, among you addressed about the best qualities that are required for uh, effective leadership. Um, uh, there's one um, question from um, Aji, Aji Roba Daniel. Um, who's asking, he would like to know why it is so difficult to have intergenerational partnerships mm -hmm. despite the fact that the role of young people in making things happen continues to be celebrated. Um, he or she feels that they want um, um, young people to talk as young people but they really don't want their voice to count. Um, and there's an interesting point. Um, and um, there, uh, there are a couple of people asking um, how you would describe a bad leader. How do you describe a leader? A bad leader. A bad leader. <laughs> <Yeah>. Oh. <laughs> no, I, I think the, 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 some interesting points have been raised here because um, it is not young people must talk to each other, but the older generation and the younger generation must also talk. That dialogue is absolutely essential. We cannot tell the young people the future is theirs. They are going to inherit the future and they are going to be responsible, but we don't associate them with the decisions we are taking, which will impact on that future. And this is why it's extremely important that the intergenerational dialogue takes place, that in committees, either at the local or the national level, we should find ways of bringing in various generations so that when we talk of a, a generational change, the next generation is ready to take over. The difficulty we've had in our world when you look at politics and others is that the, those who get there hold on and hold on for so long and sometimes don't want to move at all and do not create space mm -hmm. that allows others and the young people to come up. And this is uh, something that we need to do something about. And I can tell you almost every group I mean, I keep saying, let's bring in the ne next generation. We are all aging. Tomorrow we'll all be gone and you don't want to create a vacuum. You need to have continuity and you can only have it by bringing in the young people, uh, relying on their energy, their ideas and working with them to move uh, forward. Uh, a bad leader uh, uh, it's not easy, it's, it, it, it's easy to, to describe. I mean, you see leaders who do not listen, who believe they are always right, who are uh, stubborn, who in some cases, even when the decision is patently wrong, can not only not change direction, but refuse to listen uh, to others. 
you have to be open as a leader. You have to learn to listen. And a leader need not always be right. A good leader is also a good follower. You must remember that. Emmanuel, I saw your hand go up. Yeah, I would like to add something about uh, intergenerational issues. We work a lot about these issues in my company, and I am wondering how can we build pairs of leaders, a young leader and a whole leader working together, a kind of reverse mentoring. What do you think about this idea? The idea of young leader and an old leader working together. No, exactly. that working together. Yes. Yeah. No, that 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 I think is ideal. That is very uh, uh, great in today's world. First of all, the older person may have wisdom and ideas that the young person may have. You on the issue of modern technology and communications and all this have a lot to teach the older person. Yeah, exactly. And that is a, a, a powerful combination, and you can share. Uh, your experiences and build a dynamic modern company and be able to network with others where the old approaches may not be as effective as the new ones. So the idea of combining uh, forces, old and, and young, I think is a wonderful idea and I encourage you to do that. Okay, maybe would you agree to team up with us? So, to do the pair. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> okay. I, should I? Uh, um, I think we've been at. Uh, um, we have. We, could, yeah, we should move on to the next section now if you're ready. Okay, let, let's, let's move to the next session. It's still part of today's discussion. We are going to, in a way, we touched on it briefly. It's young people and politics. Young people and politics, and I think uh, you are all living uh, uh, in a very exciting times in terms of politics and social activism. So I open up that topic, and I would want to call on Karuna and Leslie uh, to lead to make the first comments. Karuna, you go first. Thank you, sir. So well, for me, when it comes to young people and politics, there are two main aspects of this. The first one is how do we deal with the apathy of young people towards politics and get them interested in politics? Because from what I understand, politics is considered as something very dirty, very complicated, dense, and even repulsive to young people. And it's not a priority, it's not a career option for most of young people. Young people are more keen on getting a good job, a good education, a good living, life, a good lifestyle, and uh, politics is not a priority. But these are the very young people who criticize uh, politicians and politics and want, um, want to live in a better world. They want social reform. So how, I'd like to know how can young people um, how can we deal with the apathy of young people and and uh, show them that the only way they can um, the only way that they can uh, like the only uh, the only way that they can get involved uh, in politics is actually to come in the dirt and um, I also think it's um, we call politics dirty because we allow politicians to make dirty moves and uh, the second thing I want to talk about is the governance side of it how can we have the correct framework for young people to be involved in political decision making, not just be involved, but be involved actively, effectively. Um, for example, I, I worked on a project, on a campaign called Wake Up Call, Marish, Wake Up Call Mauritius last year, where we asked the Mauritian government to include an official youth delegate to the Rio Plus 20 summit. This is because I've attended a lot of UN conferences and environmental negotiations where I've seen young people um, either are underrepresented, for example, from Mauritius, despite being the most vulnerable, or, if they do attend the summit, we treat it as mere observers. We're not given, the, uh, we're not given um, access, we, we have different badges, we're not given access to all internal meetings, we don't have as much as say in the negotiations. So how can we have the correct framework for young people to participate in such conferences? And from, what I, from my experience of dealing with the Mauritian government and asking them to involve young people in political decision making, I found out that there were three challenges. One is bureaucracy, and these procedures take a very long time. 
Uh, the second one is, do we treat young people different from civil society? Because when we asked the government to have young people in the official delegation, our minister told us that um, if we put one young person, we'll have to put someone from the women's group, from the NGO group, and it's going to be a very large delegation. And the last one is, how can we convince um, the older generation that we are indeed mature enough to mature enough to participate in decision making. We have the capacity. We are not just mere noise makers, but we can be um, very um, active partners. So these are just two aspects that I want to talk about. Thank you very much, Irina. You've made some very good points. Let, let let's now turn to Leslie. Leslie. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I think it goes without saying, especially in the context of South Africa, where we have elections coming up next year. And, you, you know, the picture is almost the same everywhere. We are set as young people to inherit chronic social, economic, and environmental challenges that our governments are failing to, to deal with. And as young people, we have a larger stake in the destinies of our nations. And so it's very important that throughout the political process, we are involved actively. But the reality on the ground is very different. I mean, you look at the world picture where the generations are becoming more younger and more younger. In South Africa, for instance, we have um, over 70% of people being under the age of 35. And you look at that and you look in comparison in terms of their representation in the policy making processes in government. Are we really mirroring the kind of society that we are seeing on the ground? That, you know, that, that does not happen in terms of political leadership. And from political rhetorics where you hear our leaders saying we're going to make changes, we're going to do so forth and the political reality, there exists a wide gap. And as a result, there's political apathy amongst young people. So the questions that we are bringing as young people is to say, how do we become relevant, not only relevant by starting one organization here and doing one project there, but how do we formalize ourselves to become a force to be reckoned with that can change the political course of our nation? And how can we then inspire other young people, those who, I mean, we need to take into consideration that other young people are not at the stage where they are politically um, educated so they don't know the dynamics how do we bring those young people into the playground and say become politically active be able to make and hold your leaders accountable how do you do that if you do not even know how what to look at to begin with. So, so that's, those are some of the few issues that I would like us to discuss so that even next year going into elections from South Africa, as young people, we're able to have a wider and a louder stance. Uh, uh, th thank you very much. But I think um, you are right that most societies today have a large bulge of younger population. The younger people people want to get involved in, in politics. But to get involved in politics, you have to have structures and you have to have objectives. Let's assume that the issues of great concern to your generation is unemployment, the environment, the fight against corruption, and the sense that the political leaders are not doing enough about this. How do you then organize yourself to ensure that they do act on them? How do you organize yourself to ensure that these issues of concern to you move up the political agenda? It becomes a priority also for the politicians. You can only do that if you organize yourself and become a force. And you have the tools. Through social network, you can organize. We saw what young people and the organization did, for example, in the elections in the United States like that led to the election of President Obama in the first and the second elections. Why can't young people organize themselves in your societies, put pressure on the politicians to focus on your issues? And when they know you have that sort of structure, and you can impact on the results of elections, they will pay attention to you. Otherwise, they are not going to come looking for you. You have to make them uh, focus attention on all the other lobby groups who lobby politicians, go to leaders to get what they want. This is what they do. 
and you should or if you are a members of a political group make sure that the youth wing is active is organized is participates at the grassroots level can get other young people to uh, participate in politics apathy is not the answer when people have the right to vote and they don't vote they are making the situation worse and we also have to remember when we look around the world people are dying to get the right to vote and yet some of us who have it don't use it and if you don't you have yourselves to blame so define your objectives organize and make things happen you have the capacity who else wants to comment on this Manuel Thank you. Um, about this question of young leaders and politics, I have made a little experience I would like to share with you. At the beginning of the experience, we had a conviction. Young people wanted to be more present in the fields of politics. Mm -hmm. But the old politicians will simply not accept to leave. Mm -hmm. So we organized La Relève, a French think tank dedicated to putting the youth back in the political game. Mm -hmm. We organized three meetings with mm -hmm. highly motivated young people mm -hmm. from every sector and very different professional activities. Yeah. And it was a failure. Why? Because young people no longer consider politics as a way to achieve their goals for society. They have ideals, convictions, but they don't want to talk. They want to act concretely. And they do act concretely. We discovered many young entrepreneurs who created their companies and who have a real impact on the world, on the way to do business, on society. So basically, by doing business, they go back to the very roots of politics. They animate the life of the city. So we conclude that at least in developed countries, entrepreneurs are maybe the new politicians. What Do you share this point of view? Mm. Emmanuel, I think you've raised a very I important issue in the sense that uh, uh, sometimes the older generation who have seats in parliament who have a political advantage want to hold on to it and they don't give it up easily they see the young as a threat which is normal is is a, is a normal way of uh, uh, politics but the young should not be dissuaded or discouraged so easily you you have to persevere you have to organize, you have to use your numbers and put up candidates that you can support and can make changes in the political earth. And the idea of going to business and entrepreneurship, that is fine. You need to create jobs and interestingly enough is small medium sized companies that create the jobs, not the big corporations. And so the more small and medium-sized companies we have, you are right, it's good for the society and the community. But if the smart young people refuse to go into politics and want to focus on business, who do you think is going to make the laws for you in parliament? Do you leave the same politicians you don't trust right, to make laws for your community and even for business? Or you want to be there and participate in the legislation that will affect your uh, community, that will affect how business is done, that will be uh, supportive. And so you, it's not either or. You need to be in the political arena as well. But bravo, go ahead and create the companies, create jobs, but have an impact on the politics as well. But don't you think it exists a, another way to do politics? Through business. Well, Maybe. we've. Well, we, uh, it, it depends. I mean, if you look at the system in the United States, where quite a lot of um, uh, businesses do not necessarily put their corporate leaders up for elections, but they lobby the politicians to do what they want. And, and then, of course, the citizens complain that um, the politicians are allowing the businessmen to influence legislation, to push them in the next in the direction they want them to do, 
and that creates tensions and I, I would tell you that would create even more tensions in France if that were to happen that this they feel is a businessman businesswomen and the rich people in the corporate world who are steering politicians in, in Parliament I think that quite a lot of that would happen but I really also think you need some people also in the arena in the Parliament and uh, don't give up politics altogether and vote apathy really works against your interest thank you Leslie um, yes, uh, um, Karuna touched um, on, on a very um, important issue from my side and what she mentioned was that you have in some other instances where government and leaders would, um, would, would get young people to be represented in certain structures, whether it be in terms of their UN delegation or even in parliament. But however, you find that those young people are only sent for face value. Their contribution are not taken seriously because apparently we are said to be a very radical generation and most of our elder leaders um, um, are indifferent to, uh, to the ideas that we come with. So how do we ensure that within those structures that the opportunities that we are given to represent the objectives of the young people on the ground, how do we ensure that they are taken, they are, they are taken seriously by the leaders and we are not only represented for the sake of numbers and face value? Yeah, I, 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 I think here uh, s some of what you and uh, Karuna have said uh, will happen, does happen in the sense that in some of these institutions there is a tendency to take seniority and age rather too seriously in the sense that this is a young woman, a young uh, man, what does he know, pay your dues and then you can uh, uh, make a contribution. But you also have a way of dealing with that. You can I identify some of these old men and women who are leaders in the group, in the parliament or the committee <clears throat> and try to explain to them what you are trying to do and also the fact that you are, you are the voice of the youth. It's not you alone, that you have thousands behind you who share uh, your view. You may sometimes even invite them to come and talk to your group and when they come and meet the group who are working with you and, and, and see them in reality, they will not, not only be seeing young people as politicians, they would also be seeing votes. And they know that with that support, you can put the heat on them. You can put their feet to the fire and they will begin to listen to you. You have to work out strategies of how to be effective, how to get them to listen don't give up to say they don't take you seriously. Yes, in a way, if you go to, as a part of the delegation to the UN General Assembly, the governmental policy may have been made even before you take you board the plane and they go to New York and repeat it. At that level, it's too late to make an input, but the input has to be done at home before you do. Listen to it and when you go back to say, I heard what you said at the UN in New York, but this doesn't reflect our, our, our views. We, the youth, this is the way we see it. And I hope next year, if you go, you will reflect. Let's change, get into dialogue with them and, and do uh, try to have your inputs. I see uh, <clears throat> uh, Dan wants to come in. Yes, um, two things. I just wanted to say briefly that um, in my role as the UN Youth Delegate for Australia, I had a unique privilege of connecting to politicians. And it was one of the questions, Leslie, that often came up, is your role you know, tokenism? Um, but Mr. Anand has identified um, one thing that was rang true to me, and that is that it starts a dialogue, and, it, and it's the start of a process. Yeah. Um, and it means that those relationships are built um, and that understanding is built. So when I advocate for change, I've got a better awareness of the complexities. Um, no. So that's my point. Sorry, go on. Yeah. I think Dan has made a point here because all of you, the young people, all you want to change things, which is also a trend in your nature. And because you are young and you want to change, you're also in a hurry and sometimes 
you tend to be impatient. Uh, change is a process, it's not an event. And sometimes it can take time. So you have to learn to be a patient and sometimes even have a relative idea as to how long it may take you to make the change. And don't be frustrated and don't be put off so easily because there is a time element to effect and change. And uh, uh, <coughs> continue. Dan, you want go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Turner, the second point is back to your discussion with Emmanuel Pryor, um, and it's about the business and politics. And my question is, what defines success when a young person is involved in politics? Um, in capitalism, profit defines success, and that is never satisfied. You see people get more and more and more profit, and they're, and they're never satisfied, and that drives them to achieve great things. Uh, what, what's the equivalent in the political realm? I, I think in the in the in the political realm, the kind of uh, changes and success you are referring to will be gradual. For example, uh, in a situation of high un unemployment, if a young leader or young organization were to be able to organize themselves and get a message to the government, that for us. The most important thing is to create jobs, to create opportunities, or give us uh, uh, facilities to start our own company. And we would want you as a, com as a government to come up with legislation and approaches that will support our needs. If you get that sort of legislation, or even get a serious debate in Parliament on the issue where there had been none, you are, it is successful. If you can organize yourself in a situation where last elections the number of young people voting was very low and with the mobil advocacy, mobilization, grassroots movement, you get the young votes to go up by 5% or 10%, that is success. If you're able to get young leaders elected to keep the voice up, that is success. Even if it's not the young leaders, but leaders who are sensitive to the concerns of the young, to the concerns of the environment, to, and, and the issues that you, are, uh, you feel strongly about, that is success. And, and, and so you, there are many ways of measuring success. It doesn't even sometimes necessarily mean that the leader, the youth leader himself or herself, has to um, uh, be elected to parliament. You know, and, and you can do some interest. I've seen young people doing all sorts of things. Look at the change educational reform in Chile, for example, led by a movement led by a young woman, Camila, and the students. And it brought about national educational changes. Thank you. And so it's, it's easier to measure success in the corporate world uh, because uh, it's <coughs> maximization of profit. If you made hundred dollars last year and you make two hundred hundred percent increase, and it's easy. But in politics and social issues, it's much more difficult. Louise, you want? To? Yes, I just thought you might like to hear some of the comments that are coming in through social media. Mm -hmm. um, we have a uh, Carissa in Texas who says that she agrees with Karuna. Um, and that we very much need to work on getting more young people involved in politics to have a voice for, for their future. And she thinks we allow politics to be called dirty because we allow politicians to make dirty moves. Um, uh, Barker in the Mauritius, um, she says that civil service, even more than politics, is not, seen, is not youth friendly and that the imperative is to find ways to overcome bureaucracy and establish leadership within political structures. And that's coming from a girl that is a civil servant. Um, uh, and Tim Cook Joffa says that in Africa, this, and this is touching on some of the points that you've, uh, you've just discussed, he says that in Africa where leadership is associated with age and so-called wisdom that comes with it, young people are advised to stay away from politics and even those who try feel like outsiders and seldom to make any significant impact. So that's reflecting some of the points that Leslie was making. Mm -hmm. um, we've got Hassan Nada, who's talking um, from Egypt. 
um, and he says that the problem they have there in organizing youth groups is that statistically speaking it is a huge group of almost 87 million people and so that they find that youth groups are very scattered and mm. we'd like to learn more about how to collaborate and organize mm. such a vast number because the current result is that hundreds and thousands of youth groups scattered around and are um, disorganized they end up debating with each other mm -hmm. instead of addressing the thing that they wanted yeah. to address in the first place um, and, and a final point that I'll bring in from, from Simon who's quoting from the Netherlands but has just um, completed a research study in Sierra Leone he says that in many African countries the question is not about organizing young people are hungry, jobless and uneducated we need more than lobbying. The people that lobby are the underprivileged few. The, 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 my research, it's, sorry, the privileged few, I do apologize, the people that lobby are the privileged few. He says his research in Sierra Leone last year showed that while young people are not oblivious to the issues that affect them, they want food, education and jobs first. No, th those are useful uh, uh, comments and of course food, jobs and education are basic and one uh, would w want them. But if you are not getting them from your government, if you are not getting them from those in authority who cannot organize themselves and lead to make sure these services are provided, do you sit on your hands or do you decide to do something about it? And I think uh, one point we should not forget, when we talk of young people taking action, young people organizing themselves. Young people cannot organize themselves and stand alone. As you've noticed, other groups work with each other. They link up with each other. The youth group will have to identify the political forces at play and which ones they can link up with to get their uh, objectives achieved. So I'm not suggesting you work alone, but when it comes to organization and networking, you are better at it than the older, older generation. You have the tools. I mean, when I hear people talk about the Arab Spring, the Arab Awakening as a internet revolution, the internet was a tool that they used to organize uh, themselves. And you can use that to organize yourself, pull together your group, and link up with other forces on the political scene to achieve your objectives. And when you are that well organized and they know you can make a difference on election day, my friends, I can assure you, you will have more influence than you can handle. And, and, and think, think about that. Hmm? Karuna, is there something else you want to say? You, you started us off with some very useful uh, comments. Haven't heard what others have s said. Anything else you want to add? Yes, thank you, Mr. Allen. And I just want to uh, thank Leslie for bringing up um, my point again. Um, I just want to add from my own experience of uh, dealing with ministers, um, it's very important um, to have respect. Respect is particularly important in the African society and the Mauritian society and you need to find the right balance between respect and being assertive. If you're not respectful to, um, to each other, not just politicians, but to each other, you will be considered as a noise maker. And as a young person, we don't want to be considered as a noise maker and not be heard, but rather as someone who can bring in constructive criticism and solutions. Um, very quickly, a second thing which I wanted to ask you, Mr. Anand, is um, if we have the time, uh, what is your experience of politics back then, in your time and now? How is it different? Do you think um, young people, uh, young youth were more inclusive back then than now? You mean the difference be uh, in politics you. between young people at my time and young people now, you mean? Is that the question? Yes, what's, how do you find that? Yes, what, what's, yeah. well, how do you find it different when we talk about politics and young people back in your time and now? Yeah, I, I think in fact, uh, in some ways, young people today have more opportunities than they did in my time. Uh, first of all, uh, someone referred to age and the importance of age in Africa. When I was growing up, that was even more important, that uh, 
the young were to be seen, not heard, and uh, it was also uh, the, the struggle for independence, and often the young were in the streets, part of the demonstrations, but not necessarily part of the political decision-making. That has changed over time. We didn't have the tools that you have today, but in, your, in today's world, you, are, you, are, you have the tools, you are better educated, you have lots of information and lots of knowledge, which can not only be limited to you, can also share it with your own parents, with your, in your own homes. And in fact, the education you can offer across the board to your peers in discussions at home and sharing uh, what you pick up from your own research uh, can play a very important uh, role. What I would advise is really refuse to be frustrated, refuse to be provoked because you feel you are not being listened to or being taken uh, seriously. You have to understand that uh, the older generation will have to take you seriously. It's a question of time and be persistent. Be persistent. If you get frustrated and walk away, you're undermining your own cause. Uh, one doesn't have to be rude, one doesn't have to be aggressive, but can make the points firmly and consistently and organize to put pressure on, on the politicians and the leaders. Manuel, did you did I see your hand up? No. No. Okay. <laughs> Good. Shall we move now to the final segment? Let's let's move now to the final segment, and here I'm going to ask uh, uh, Dan and Emmanuel uh, to lead us. What are the strat strategies and tools to empower young people? strategies and tools to empower young people. Dan, you go first and then Emmanuel. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I reflect on a speech that I heard you give, um, Mr. Anam, where you said tolerance, intercultural dialogue and respect for diversity are more essential than ever in a world where people are becoming more and more closely interconnected. And I, I'm interested about um, um, Emmanuel will speak more about some of the positive impacts of this interconnection. But I'm interested on your wise reflections on some of the negative impacts of this interconnection. Uh, many young people spoke to me as I tra travelled around Australia about the impact of cyberbullying. Um, and one young girl, um, Sarah in Meningi, South Australia, she said, is this increased in con connectivity through social media overall a good thing? Um, so. Yeah, I guess there there has been some negatives that have come with this, um, and especially with in regard to um, barriers to young people achieving. Some of those are put up by um, different special interest groups and and religion. Um, and I'm I'm just wondering what your perspective is on this. Mm -hmm. Okay, Let, let's hear from Manuel, and then I will react. Manuel. Yeah, Mr. Anand, I have a global question about employment of young people divided in two parts. And I know the, the first part of my question is a little bit idealistic. Uh, we are in a context of worldwide crisis, both economical and political. Uh, do you not believe that this crisis is a huge opportunity to give a more important role to young people since uh, our system, your system, is not working very well. I'm thinking about global governance, about Syria, about our tentative to regulate the financial system. Mm -hmm. Why don't we gamble on youngness, just to try, not mm -hmm. only in politics, but everywhere? This yeah. is the first part of my question, <coughs> and the second mm -hmm. one is, what do you think about all these alternative powers created by our generation, the first global generation, through internet and new technologies? I'm thinking about Anonymous, the Occupy movement, the Indignados, etc. Uh, do you not believe that it's a new way of expression, communication, action, and then empowerment? A kind of counter power created by young people with their own tools to express themselves, a new way to impact the world. Thank you very much. Yeah. 
No, I, I think today we, we live in a, in, a, in, in a truly interconnected world. And what is sad is um, at the same time we are seeing lots of tensions within society. We are witnessing it is a time when people from all over the world, from all cultures, all races, are mixed together, live, living next to each other in our cities. And it is at the same time where we have the tensions and sometimes uh, tensions about immigration, tensions about religion, tensions about others, and barriers put in the way of young people and women. And these barriers will have to be removed because any society that doesn't use all the talents of his society is going to be at a disadvantage, particularly if you don't develop and exploit the talents and the energy of the youth. Uh, it's, it's extremely uh, in, in, important. And of course, you are right to say that today the world is so interconnected. You have, um, when I look at civil society, you have robust civil society movements that cut across the world, whether they are in Australia, in Mexico, or in South Africa, they are able to network and come together to have an impact. Uh, we, we are seeing e economic, financial and social problems all over the world and unfortunately because of this I have a sense that the trust, the trust between people and leaders is broken and that has to be really re-established because if that trust is not there and it's not re-established it's extremely difficult to put through the changes that are required. It's extremely difficult to put through the changes because the people do not believe whatever the leaders tell them. And it becomes a catch-22 uh, situation. Uh, and so the young have a lot to do to play. And apart from coordinating and cooperating with each other, you also have to feed into the political leadership of your country and, and uh, push for the right changes that you, you want to uh, see. And often you can bring to bear some of the lessons you've learned from your own contacts uh, around the world. Let, let's open it up to the others. Chris? Um, I kind of wanted to go off of uh, Dan's topic. Um, and the negativity of social media. Um, he mentioned cyberbullying, and there's another term called slacktivism that I've been hearing a lot of. And basically, it's people, you know, liking things on Facebook or feeling like they're making a difference with activism, but it's really sometimes just clicking or things like that. Um, there's a campaign by UNICEF recently um, called "Likes Don't Save Lives," and I saw this commercial with two young boys. Um, and they were saying how, you know, we have 180,000 likes, maybe in two months we'll get 200,000 likes, and that will help us. Um, I agree that, you know, campaigns and awareness is positive and can absolutely bring awareness to issues like we were talking about earlier in politics, but I would love to see what people think about the term slacktivism and, and that we're not maybe taking it to the next level as far as social action and, and taking it to the next step besides awareness. So you're making a difference between positive activism and the kind of activism which is self-serving but doesn't really add much to society. And I think we see a lot of that too. Yeah. Does anyone else want to uh, comment? Mm -hmm. Sue, do you want to say anything? Dan and then um. Sue. Sue, are you still with us? We haven't heard yeah. from you. Okay. okay. Okay, let Dan go and then Sue. Thanks, Mr. Anand. And my, I recognize what you said, Christopher, and I, and I agree with that. I actually addressed some of those thoughts in my speech to the General Assembly, and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll send you a link through to that um, in okay. talking about social media. Um, one of the things I also mentioned in that speech was um, all the benefits that we've heard highlighted by Mr. Anand and by Emmanuel. Um, are not necessarily available to all and there, there are two that I'm thinking of um, the, di the, the divide in terms of age 
um, and we have to be aware of the digital divide um, in that those that, who do not have experience with technology, um, they need to be still benefiting. Um, so there needs to be some kind of process there whereby they're educated, um, the older ones amongst us that is. But perhaps more pertinent to the work I'm doing is those in least developed countries. Um, I'm partnering with an organisation which is Connect the Blue Continent and we're looking at the small Pacific Islands where there's not the incentive for a telco to go in, there's not the incentive for a telco to invest in infrastructure for internet and therefore we're getting this digital divide and I'm really interested to see some strong solutions whether it's the sustainable development goals in mm -hmm. post 2015 or, or other ideas that can address that. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, 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 Sue. Yeah. Um, well, I want to uh, take on Chris' points about uh, how the the new this new term that he was talking about. I think I I don't see any downside on expanding the level of awareness and ju and the fact that people will be just liking things. That only means that they are just becoming. The information is being shared, and related to that, uh, I was reading this article the other day that was talking about about this phenomenon. And it was saying that partly uh, one of the reasons is because the information that we get is so broad and so large. We we tend to get a lot of information from things that mm -hmm. we don't see in, in our daily lives, mm -hmm. and that when we see this information, we tend to be more indifferent. However, the point they were trying to make is that. Uh, when you go into a smaller scale and when you go into like people trying to achieve a goal with uh, either crowdfunding or through Facebooking or things like that, there has actually been many cases of success that people have seen that this particular problem is very close to them and through this expansion of awareness it's easier <coughs> to contribute or to you know, make a difference on it. <coughs> Good. No. Uh, th th thank you very much. Who wants to talk about activism? How do we ensure that the kind of activism we engage in as young people is constructive, is not self-serving, is not negative, and that uh, we are trying to impact on our s society? Sue, you want you see your hand up? Oh, no. Sorry. No. Okay. <laughs> Good. Nobody, uh, Luis, you you have uh, you've heard from the wider world. Um, I've I've you? heard a little from the wider world. Yes, they are, um, and they're tending to agree with um uh, with what's been said. Um, some people are talking about the the usefulness of social media, obviously, mm -hmm. um, and um uh, and there are a couple of other posters talking about the difficulties of connecting those movements together to make them more effective. Um, mm -hmm. But that's specifically about um, tools rather than strategies. Strategies, yeah, 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 yeah. But I think uh, uh, I don't know whether it was Dan. One of you made an important point that these tools are not available to everybody. Yeah. Which, which is, which is a, a, a fact. Uh, but then even those who do not have the tools, the kind of tools we, we, uh, we take for granted, can organize themselves uh, to um, uh, protect their interest. I, I have seen uh, situations where villagers have sometimes woken up and challenged the leaders to do what is required for them to uh, uh, lead, and 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 it's one of the. You know, I, I think the last time I've sort of in previous conversations I've indicated that where leaders fail to lead, the people can make them follow. The people can lead, mm. and when I say the people can lead, I mean that because um, uh, if if there's enough noise enough pressure, enough organization, the leaders will follow the people. But if the people are apathetic, they don't vote, they don't care, you're leaving the field to the politicians to do whatever they want. And there are wonderful examples of the people making the politicians follow. We saw it in India on the question of the uh, corruption, when 
as I did the um, um, hunger strike, and thousands went to the street, and the government reacted. In the, in that case, there were for, we've seen some of it to some extent in North Africa. We've seen it in your own cities. Dan, I see your hand is up. Yeah, at risk of commenting too much. <laughs> no, no, that's um, fine. Uh, one of the things that I learned from a One Young World counsellor, um, Oscar Morales, who was the founder of A Million Voices Against FARC, is that social media can be really powerful in tearing down a bad thing. Um, the cause becomes the champion. People get behind that and they can tear down a bad thing. Yeah. My question is, does it have potential for establishing a good thing? Mm -hmm. Can it be useful for the development of character, the character um, virtues, um, aspirations within young people mm -hmm. to improve mm -hmm. well-being and, and to flourish and, and really develop something more than just the maintenance of human rights? What are yeah. your thoughts on this? Okay. Leslie, you come in. If you want to comment, and then I'll come in. Leslie, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fellow. Just adding on Dan's point, I think in, in my personally, in, in my experience, what I found is that um, because of the ease and of our interconnectivity and how accessible the internet and the social media is, you find that our efforts are often replicated. Um, for instance, in South Africa, you'll find that we're starting a youth advocacy group and then one is also starting it all, all over. And as such, instead of strengthening the effort that oftentimes discards our efforts and you have all these dissected uh, groups doing similar thing but not coordinating and you know that that, that presents a, a, a difficulty from from having a unified voice as young people and maybe you would you you could touch on on, on that just a little bit and I was having a conversation with a friend about the power of um, social media and what we found is that that's not where it should end, just on social media. How do we make the transition from starting the conversation on the social networks and then moving to formalizing it so that it works on the ground? It does not end on Facebook or Twitter. No, uh, very useful comments from both of you. Uh, I, f first of all, I, I think um, uh, social media and the tools we have can be used constructively and positively whether it's on issue of human rights, uh, whether it's on the fight against poverty or the fight against corruption, a lot can be done. Yes, you are right that it, it can be fragmented, but that is also the, uh, the, the, the wonderful thing about the, uh, the net is in that you can coordinate very easily. Let's assume that you decide to set up a campaign to fight corruption and you discover 20 other people are doing the same thing which is fine would you think of reaching out to them and say hey let's come together coordinate strategy create a real force and go to our politicians or those who should take elections make this public, let them know there's real energy behind this and that the issue we are dealing with has legs and we want action. I have seen this done across the world. For example, when we were trying to set up the um, International Criminal Court, NGOs from around the world linked up and supported the effort and put collective pressure on their governments to support the effort. Another example is the, the banning of landmines, which killed so many people, even after wars, lying there waiting to maim someone. We could not have got the convention without civil society. And they were spread all over the world, but they coordinated their efforts to have a real impact. And I suggest you can do the same at your national level. But it, it, it takes the courage to reach out to the others and say, let's work together. We have greater, you'll be, you'll be amazed as to how receptive most of them will be. Some will not because they want to run their own show and lead. But many will be attracted by this possibility of coming together and pushing for the common good. 
Um, Mr. Lennon, can I interject? We've got about 10 minutes left, um, just slightly over that. And um, it would be um, perhaps a good opportunity to ask all the participants to briefly summarise what they um, what they've gained from the discussion today, and whether they've got any ideas for action or initiatives that they can um, continue with yeah. or start as a result of the hangout. Um, and um, we, we'd really look forward to talking about some of those things at the One Young World Summit in, in, in October. Um, and then we, we can move to your concluding comments. Would that be all right? That, that would be fine, and I think it's very good. The emphasis should be action. What actions? Are you yeah. going what to you going take to <laughs> when you go back uh, home? This We've had very useful discussion. Some good ideas have come up, but you're not going to leave them to me. You are the leaders. You are the leaders of the 21st century. What are you going to do when you go back? Sum up very briefly, 30 seconds each. Let's go ahead. We start with you, Chris. Great. Thank you. Um, so yeah, this has been very invaluable. Um, from from starting about when we first started talking about what is a leader, uh, you mentioned leadership can be can happen at all levels, and I think that's a huge takeaway. Regardless of where you are, you can make a difference in your school, your community, um, and your nation, your, the world. So I think that was a big big takeaway for me. And um, but as far as action, there was a lot of discussion on connection, collaboration, working together, um, and that's something I'm very passionate about as well. Um, Leslie made a comment about, you know, it doesn't end at Facebook. We need to take it to the next level. We can raise awareness on Facebook, but, you know, we need to take it to the next level. We need to turn social media into social action. And um, that's something that I'm working on. I want to create something that's going to help people collaborate and connect um, and, and really take it, take it to the next level as far as social action goes. Thank you, Chris. Dan? When you don't have the luxury of a bottom line and profit to finding your success, you emphasise to me, Mr. Anand, that it's really important that we set goals and seek to achieve and measure those goals. And I'm going to look out for people that are achieving what I believe are, are great goals to be achieving and commend them on it so they get some measure and some feedback of that success um, which they would have if they were making profit in the corporate world. Thank you, Dan. Emmanuel, yeah, to sum up, yeah, just three points very quickly. First, I think uh, we can be optimistic because our generation has the power to change or to save the world, mm -hmm. and we will do it certainly with new tools, a new form of employment, mm -hmm. and a new way to do politics. Secondly, I strongly believe in the efficiency of intergenerational transmission mm -hmm. between old and younger people mm -hmm. as one of the means to prepare the new world. And uh, thirdly, I would like to announce a new project. I think uh, everybody at One Young World's new Women Up, but we have a new a new project. We have made a partnership with a Brazilian startup to create the first digital collaborative book by and for the Y generation among the world. The name, The Builders, the concept, one chapter, one country, one builder. And the idea is to prove that we are the first global generation and to promote all these alternative systems created by young people all over the world in the fields of education, politics, economic, and so on. And I will be so proud to present the result of this work in Johannesburg for the next One Young World Summit. Very good. Keep up your optimism. Yeah, Opt thanks. Optimists <laughs> always die it. happier. Yeah. <laughs> Karuna. I will do that. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Allen, and thank, thank you, everyone. This has been very, very um, valuable for me indeed. And what I'm taking away from this is that if we need, if we are going ahead and asking the government to create the right framework for um, effective uh, youth, participation, youth participation and decision making, we have to balance that with providing the government, with providing um, policymakers with the right pool of um, empowered and trained young people who have the capacity to actually be effective in decision making processes. So, for example, if if I'm going to be asking my government to have um, um, a, a, a officially delegate to another COP conference, 
um, I would make sure that I speak to a lot of young people, meet at schools and colleges, and um, train them and make policy language more access accessible to them. And finally, um, also when it comes to um, getting young people in, uh, getting official youth delegates in um, within negotiations. Uh, we need to make sure that they're not there for face value, so not just have official delegates attend the conference, but ask the government to involve them right at the beginning of the process, which maybe starts like a year or two years back. So these are my two takeaways. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Leslie. Yes, thank you, you very much, Seth. For, for the great opportunity once more. What I take away from this session is that as young people, we need to refuse to be frustrated and we need to refuse to be provoked. And moving forward, we must strengthen our capacity, like you said, and widen our horizon. As a young person, I'm going to work with other young people in South Africa. We have national elections coming next year and we need our issues as young people to be put right at the top of the agenda. Excellent. Because as young people, we have a larger state. So I'm going to coordinate and work with other young people to ensure that this happens. And in closing, I'd like to just take a quote from one of our late leaders, Ora Tambo, who says that uh, a nation that does not take care of its young people does not deserve a future and will not have a future. Thank you very much, sir. Good. Sue. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This, was, this has been very, very enriching. And for me, I think uh, there are two main takeaways. One is related to one thing that was uh, repeatedly talk about about organizations and having organizations and structures because I think there is a lot of people like us who are out there thinking that there is something fundamentally wrong with the way we are doing things right now and that we need to change it. So I think that for me one of the key takeaways is continue to build networks and continue to foster the network of people who like us think that there needs to be changed and that we need to implement that change. And the second part is related to um, the credibility of young people and being put there just for face value. And I think that an important part here is like, even if we are put there for the wrong reasons or not the way we would like it, mm -hmm. we should take advantage of that opportunity and make the most out of it and use it for our advantage and to you know, foster whatever change we're trying to make. Th th thank you very much, Sue. Let me conclude by saying that uh, uh, today I've been uh, very fortunate to have serious discussions with six leaders. All of you are leaders already. The, the things you're doing in your own communities and this is how it begins. 20, 10, 20 years from now, when I see you again, I'm sure you'll be doing great things and you'll be having impact on your own community. So don't overestimate, underestimate your capabilities and don't hold back. But as I said, you should be structured. The objectives must be clear as to what it is that you want to do and organize yourself with others to get it done. What is also important is that we have to realize that all the tools we have, we can have be on Twitter, we can have Facebook, we can have all, but they are tools. They are tools that can be extremely effective if we are clear on our objectives and what it is that we want to achieve and organize ourselves with others uh, to, to get it done. It, it is important to be active, but the activism has, must have a purpose, must have a goal. Otherwise, we get into situations where people dismiss us, that they are just making noise, the usual. But when you're focused and persistent, they cannot ignore you. Politics is your business, and you have to really remain in, in, in engaged if you're going to make a difference in your community, we should all be proud of public servants or public service and what we do to help the community as, as a whole. And you are right, we have a, 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 a world today with millions of young people whose future should be the concern of all. The older generation have not always served you well. 
And since you're going to inherit this world, get involved, get engaged early. Don't be put off. Make constructive discussions and remain engaged and make your points and contribute to the change in the world that you want to uh, see. And I would also say that um, as, the, as the first really interconnected generation, it is important that you think and think boldly. You may have to act locally, but think internationally. The world is so interconnected now that you cannot look only at the local situation. And as we've discussed, it has impact uh, on others. And uh, as leaders, you need to be able to communicate your goals. You need to be able to explain to those who are with you what it is that you're doing and why, and keep them, give them constant feedback so that they stay with you and don't think you're taking them for granted. The sort of accusations we make against current political leaders, the old men and women who don't want to give up power. So my young friends, I wish you every success and we will uh, probably meet some of you in South Africa. Have a good day. It's been a wonderful exchange. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, it falls to me to quickly close the session. I'd just like to thank all our participants, um, the online audience, you were terrific. I'd like to remind viewers as well, um, uh, if they could take a couple of minutes to answer the poll on young people and leadership, we'd really like their opinions. You'll find the links on Facebook, on Twitter for both One Young World and the Kofi Annan Foundation websites. Um, and, uh, and of course, I must thank Mr Annan, and perhaps one of our final comments that has come in on social media does that better than I could, uh, it's from a young person in Kampala, Uganda, who, who um, called Agaba Billis, who said it's a landmark to have young people's voices, have our voice heard, heard by one of the greatest leaders of our time. Mr. Anand, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>